Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. And a very good morning to you. It's um, Well, it's a covering of snow here in South Manchester. The place is covered in snow. Very chilly. Arctic conditions overnight. Welcome to Sunday Views, the day after Paddy's Day. Told you I'd be here. Told you I'd be here. Hangover, schmangover. It is the 18th of March, 2018. This is your Sunday View. Can't log on to Twitter, so tweet away, but I won't be able to read your comments. Going to take a very quick look at the front pages of the Sunday newspapers, tabloids and broadsheets and look at some of the stories inside as well. You can email me. It's richie at richieallen.co.uk. It's exactly 11 a.m. here in the great city of Manchester as we record this live in case you get the podcast a little bit later on. A lot to talk about as usual. This is your Sunday View. Thanks for joining me. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on richieallen.co.uk. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester and triggerwarning.tv. Yeah, a lot of Russian poisoning stuff in the papers. You won't be surprised by that. Lots to talk about there. Gender issues as well. Fabulous article by Peter Hitchens in the Sunday Mail. We'll get to that in a minute. This is Sunday View. Thanks for joining me. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yeah, I'm looking out the window of the studio and the snowfall, well, it's lovely. A lot of trees out our back way and it looks lovely. It's a picturesque scene, so it is. We're going to get into it because this should be an hour, but I think we might end up in overtime again today. So I'm going to get straight into it. Hope you had a terrific St. Patrick's Day. If that was your thing yesterday, if rugby union, that is, was your thing or is your thing and you're an Irish rugby fan, well, you had a good day yesterday watching the game at Twickenham, as I did myself over a few beers. Congratulations to the Irish team. Bread and circuses, I hear you shout. Maybe, maybe. Right, just before we get into the newspapers, RT.com reported yesterday. And you might say, well, they would do, wouldn't they? You might say that. It's interesting because RT is under fire. More calls by more politicians from more political parties for RT to be kicked out of the UK. But anyway, last night it reported, RT, that Russia's defence ministry has claimed that US instructors are training militants to stage false flag chemical attacks in South Syria to be blamed on the Syrian government and then to be followed by US-led airstrikes on Syrian government troops and infrastructure. The Defence Ministry has said, and I quote, we have reliable information at our disposal that US instructors have trained a number of militant groups in the vicinity of the town of At-Tanf to stage provocations involving chemical warfare in southern Syria. And that's according to a Russian general staff spokesman, a man called General Sergei Rudskoy. He told a news briefing this on Saturday night. So we believe that the US is training militants to stage false flag chemical attacks, blame it on the government, on Bashar al-Assad's government, and then use that as a pretext for strikes and an escalation of hostilities there. Okay? Won't dwell on that. That story is at RT.com. Nobody else has picked up that story today. The provocation being used as a pretext by the US and its allies to escalate things and launch attacks on the Syrian military. So there you are. Now the US military has reacted to it, has accused, not has, hasn't accused anybody of anything, has dismissed the accusations raised by the Russian Defence Ministry as extremely absurd. Absurd? Really? The idea that one government or the military of one government would stage an attack and attempt to blame that attack on another government? It certainly isn't absurd. It's been going on forever and a day. Maybe more on that a bit later on. Now, the Sunday Times, let's get straight on to the front pages of the newspapers. The Sunday Times headline, 
blackout threat to Britain as Putin hits back. Right, so here we go. These are scenarios, dreadful scenarios being imagined and dreamed up by journalists writing for national newspapers saying, well, the dastardly Russians could do this or could do that. This is the sort of journalism you wouldn't have expected of the Times of London in days of yore, maybe you would. But they say that spy chiefs have warned the bosses of the power companies in this country to boost up their security amid fears that the Russians will launch a cyber attack on the country that might put the lights out. I wonder who benefits when spy chiefs make such warnings. Well, obviously, companies who provide security for such power stations and facilities stand to make a lot of money out of this, I suppose, if you were to be cynical about it. But this is the sort of thing, this is a big story in, on the front page of the Sunday Times. I don't want to read the story because it's fairly self-explanatory. I ordinarily would read a few paragraphs. But basically, Whitehall has said that, well, a Whitehall source has said they, as in the spy agencies, the intelligence agencies, are contacting all the critical national infrastructure operators to tell them that the Russians could cyber attack your facility and could cause serious problems here, including many thousands of deaths, apparently. Thousands and thousands of deaths. Well, of course, we're coming, well, we thought we were coming out of the winter, didn't we? We thought we were. Very cold it has been over the last few days, but we should be entering spring now. But they've said that this could cause absolute chaos and it could result in a lot of deaths because obviously very senior people would suffer. They couldn't turn the heat on. Dare I say that this is bollocks? This is the sort of nonsense we had after September the 11th. We had this phenomenon after September the 11th where national newspapers would invent more and more ridiculous scenarios. You remember them shortly after September the 11th, we were treated to news features on CNN and C-SPAN warning that Al-Qaeda were going to use little miniature airplanes, little model airplanes controlled by a remote control device you would hold in your hand. And they would fly those tiny model airplanes through open windows of offices in DC and New York and elsewhere. And those would drop grenades or drop anthrax and they would cause chaos. This is utter nonsense. And this story was revived actually a few years ago, back in 2012, was it, when a man was convicted for apparently plotting to use drones to um, to cause chaos by flying drones with mini explosives into a building. So we had this phenomenon where, where newspaper journalists, rather than scrutinising what it is the government is telling us, which is that Russia did it, there can't be any other answer. Rather than scrutinise it, they're just going along with it and getting great mileage out of these scare stories. I remember those stories. Right. Andrew Marr presents the Andrew Marr Show, BBC One Sunday morning flagship programme. I know you know this because you listen to Sunday View every Sunday. And we watch it and we take some audio from it. <coughs> Excuse me. Interestingly enough, Andrew Marr sat down with the Russian ambassador to the European Union. His name is Vladimir Chizov. And Chizov brought up the Porton Down Chemical Weapons Facility. Stockpile, of course, which is just a few short miles down the road from where Sergei Skripal and his daughter were attacked. So this is Vladimir Chizov speaking with Andrew Marr, and he brings up Porton Down. When you have a nerve agent or whatever... Uh, you check it against certain samples that you retain in your laboratories. Uh, and Porton Down, as we now all know, is the largest military facility in the United Kingdom that has been dealing with chemical weapons research. Uh, and it's actually only eight miles from, from Salisbury. You're not suggesting that Porton Down is responsible for this nerve agent? I don't know. I don't know. I don't have any evidence of anything be, having been used. Doesn't have any evidence, he said, of Porton Down being involved. But it's worth mentioning, he said, that it's just down the road, right? We've been saying this ourselves for the best part of the last two weeks now. So we have. Um, that went on a bit, that conversation that um, Andrew Marr had with him. 
Uh, let me just bring it up here. Um, he was then asked, Vladimir Chizov, if Russia had any of this Novichok agent at all, or if Russia indeed had manufactured it of late. Now, this is interesting because this hasn't been covered by the mainstream media in this country. Does Russia have this nerve agent and has it manufactured it at all? No, never. No. Actually, uh, Russia has stopped uh, production of any chemical agents back in 1992. So you can you cannot even talk about any chemical agents produced by Russia. All, all that had been produced previously was produced by the Soviet Union. In 1992, the then president Boris Yeltsin signed a decree stopping all production and on, according to the International uh, Convention on Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, last year in 2017, Russia destroyed all its stockpiles. There is only one country today which hasn't done so, which is still retaining its chemical stockpiles, and that is the United States of America. Yeah, I'm sure the Israelis have shed loads as well of all manner of horrible biological weapons. The Israelis have nukes, but they don't acknowledge that they have nukes. I'm sure there are many other countries that have these horrible, disgusting weapons. So Chizov was next asked to comment on Boris Johnson's claim. He's the UK Foreign Secretary. On Boris Johnson's claim that Putin, in fact, ordered the attack. Well, that rests with the responsibility of Boris Johnson, who I believe is acting in an inappropriate manner, uh, which doesn't give him credit. This was an attack on a man widely regarded in Russia as a traitor, using a, a, a chemical agent regarded as being made in Russia. And that is why many people in Britain say it, it is overwhelmingly likely the Russians must have been responsible. And if not the Russians, who? Well, this whole case is based on assumptions, based on suspicions fueled by emotions. You are rightly referred to Mr. Skripal as a traitor, as a defector. But, uh, you know, uh, I can assure you that he is almost forgotten in Russia. He has been living in Britain for eight years now. Before that, I think I should stress the point, he was uh, officially pardoned by a presidential decree, which means that whatever one can think of him in the moral sense, uh, but uh, from the legal point of view, uh, the Russian state had nothing against him. Yeah, why would they kill him? After all the water under the bridge, the swap, remember, former CIA analyst Ray McGovern, a man who briefed six successive US presidents, gave them their morning security brief. Ray McGovern, on this programme last week, asked the question, when these countries routinely swap agents and spies who have been caught to protect them, why would they do that and jeopardise any future swaps with other countries and what have you? So you have the swaps, you have the pardon he was given, you have the World Cup coming up. Why would Russia do it? So that was Russian ambassador to the EU, Vladimir Chizov there. We will get the Boris Johnson response to that shortly. It is just worth noting, by the way, before we move on from the Sunday Times, for the crack, that there's another gender story on the front page of the Times today as well, just before we go back to Russia. Um, underneath that story about the about the power stations coming under attack from Putin, there is a story with the headline, Revealed the Transgender Email. Apparently, transgender etiquette is producing all manner of linguistic complications at Britain's academic institutions. This is true. <laughs> Students and their lecturers and their PhDs and all of that, they're being encouraged to sign their emails with their names, titles, telephone numbers and whether they prefer to be known as he or she or another option. The addition of he slash him, she slash her or they slash them to the end of emails is intended to normalise the use of gender pronouns and more importantly, dear listener, to prevent transgender students from being wrongly addressed. Oxford University are behind this. 
imagine an institution like Oxford University pandering to this monumental bollocks. Declare your preferred pronoun before speaking at union meetings, says Oxford. Madness. Ashling Murray has said it's a simple courtesy like checking you're using someone's name correctly. And the philosopher A.C. Grayling, who is a firm fan of all of this, said that he expected this practice to spread. How could you call yourself a philosopher and then utter that garbage? Just thought I'd bring it up. It's on the front page of the Times. We've talked a lot about it. There you go. Let's go to the Sunday Express. May stands up to Putin is the headline. Theresa May speaking at a spring briefing, spring conference. Conservative Party uh, do or gig yesterday vowed that the UK wouldn't cave into Kremlin threats, declaring that Britain would never tolerate acts of Russian aggression. Blah, 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 blah. We won't tolerate a threat to the life of Russian citizens and others. Uh, these comments came as Moscow, as you know, announced their expulsion of British diplomats, kind of a tit-for-tat thing. May was applauded at the Spring Forum in London as she stood in solidarity with the people of Salisbury. Isn't she amazing? Do you want to hear some of what May said? Here's the PM. To develop new powers to tackle hostile state activity and the suspension of all planned high-level contact between the UK and the Russian Federation. Today, our ambassador in Moscow was informed by the Russian government of the action they are taking in response. In light of their previous behaviour, we anticipated a response of this kind, and we will consider our next steps in the coming days, alongside our allies and partners. But Russia's response doesn't change the facts of the matter. The attempted assassination of two people on British soil for which there is no alternative conclusion other than that the Russian state was culpable. It is Russia that is in flagrant breach of international law and the Chemical Weapons Convention. Yeah, there's no evidence except that we tell you Russia did it. No evidence whatsoever, nothing, no forensic evidence. M must be repeatedly pointed out. There is a phrase that has crept into Theresa May's speeches kind of unnoticed, and my days, of course, are filled with listening to political speeches, not just hers, and I don't miss many of them, and I hear a lot of them. And the phrase being introduced, or the phrase creeping into these speeches, is this phrase. Listen carefully to the start of this. To develop new powers to tackle hostile state activity. To develop new powers. That's the phrase, you keep hearing it over and over again, to develop new powers. To develop new powers. It's usually preceded by, we'll be looking at ways to develop new powers. I'll be introducing legislation to develop new powers. New powers to combat fake news. New powers. New powers, new powers. Why is that significant? Well, because language is very important to them. And the... The unwashed, the great unwashed, you and me, are supposed to hear these phrases over and over and over again till you get used to them. New powers, new powers. Because new powers means new powers over you. Over your right to think freely, to talk freely, to disagree with them. Not only that, but to prevent them from doing what it is they want to do. These powers being more and more draconian, breaching your human rights as they go along. Problem, reaction, solution. They're using termino They're using words today, develop new powers to prevent further acts of Russian aggression, to develop new powers, to tackle instances when the UK is attacked by a foreign power. Now, the, it can't be argued that Russia has attacked the United States, excuse me, the United Kingdom, but they are framing this debate or framing this issue around this idea that by using a chemical weapon, they're calling it, not a nerve agent, a chemical weapon, that the UK itself has been attacked by Russia. Problem, reaction, solution, new powers. New powers, right? Right. Sunday Telegraph, front page, the headline is Britain to punish Putin's cronies. Now, this is all about sanctions against Kremlin-linked oligarchs who might be living in the United Kingdom, who might be 
within the reach of the UK authorities, right? The headline, Britain to punish Putin's cronies, the story, uh, new sanctions against Putin and Kremlin-linked oligarchs uh, will be introduced because of the Russian government expelling 23 British diplomats, blah, blah, blah. A government source said detailed conversations were taking place over the next few days. Uh, ahead of a National Security Council meeting planned for early this week, Theresa May was facing calls to target regime-linked money in London. Regime-linked money in London. Lord MacDonald of Riverglaven, the former Director of Public Prosecutions, said that a really aggressive financial strategy, strategy against wealthy individuals associated with Putin would be Britain's most effective weapon. I want you to remember this. This is important for the context. They're saying, let's get really aggressive financially with men, women, wealthy men, women in London who we say are associated with Putin. That would be an effective weapon. So what would they do? Well, they would go after their money effectively. And they would say that if these wealthy associates of Putin living in London, if they can't account for their money, how they earned it, if they don't have their paperwork in order, their receipts and their accounting, that they could confiscate it effectively. Keep that in mind now, because we're going to come back to that in a minute. 21 minutes past the hour, Sunday view for March 18th, 2018. Remember that about the oligarchs in London and their money. It's madness. Uh, in the Sunday Telegraph also today, Ruth Davidson, the leader of the Scottish Conservatives, has said that the United Kingdom should pull the plug, quote, on Russia today. The state-owned television station has been accused of spreading regime propaganda, including the suggestion that Britain arranged the nerve agent attack on Sergei Skripal in order to stoke Russophobia. So all manner of virtue signalers last week, Chris Bryant, Chris Leslie, Yvette Cooper, all the usual idiots, the Blairites, coming out to support the government and to support calls to get rid of RT. Jesus wept. I've conceded. Obviously, RT has never and will never itself take an editorial position against anything that Vladimir Putin has done in the past or, or is doing now. I know that. The election, of course, today, the election is today and Putin is expected to win pretty easily, of course. They're never going to do that, but they've never had a problem with any of their guests criticising Putin. And I've said before and I'll say it again, they regularly do stories, the types of stories about, well, about finance, about banking, about the intelligence agencies of the US and the UK and Israel and what they get up to. The sorts of stories that you wouldn't ever hear on BBC RTE, Sky, Fox News, whatever. RT is valuable. You've just got to take it with a pinch of salt like every other news station, including this one, dear listener. Now, earlier we heard Russian ambassador, right, before we get um, Boris Johnson's response to what the Russian ambassador said, before we hear what Boris Johnson had to say about cracking down on wealthy oligarchs in London. we better take a break. Uh, this is Sunday View. Back in a minute. Sorry I can't see the tweets. Locked out of my Twitter account. Can't do anything about that for now until they get back to me with a code. Back in exactly two minutes. Don't go anywhere. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. 
is a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others, become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www.markbayerski.com. It could just change your life forever. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. Yeah, brilliant um, couple of weeks for the show. Um, over 100,000 podcast downloads in the last uh, seven days. Um, about 65,000 listeners live every Monday to Thursday. And as I said, hundreds of thousands more getting it through iTunes, Spotify and elsewhere. Thanks to you, by the way. Thanks a lot. There's nothing like it. Uh, independent media, independent independently created programs by people that are not beholden to any editorial guidelines and um, the only the only constraint we have here of course is libel we'll never allow anything be said about anybody that isn't true or can't be proven to be true Sunday view then now we heard Russian ambassador to the EU Vladimir Chizov earlier saying that Russia destroyed its stockpile of chemical weapons left over from the Soviet Union days. Russia hasn't made any for years. By the way, I'm not saying I believe this, right? So so don't throw stuff at me later in the comments <laughs> section, right? I'm just telling you what's being said. Um, but he also suggested, did Vladimir Chizov, that Port and Down be investigated because of its proximity to where the attack on Skripal took place. He said Russia had no involvement in the attack whatsoever and he cited again why would we do it the swaps the guy had been pardoned he'd spent time in prison and all the rest of it boris johnson is the uk foreign secretary he of course was also on the andrew marr show this morning here's his response to chizov let's have a listen to what johnson had to say just in listening to the russian response listening again to the uh, the response of the uh, Russian ambassador to the EU with his satirical suggestion that this was done by uh, Port UK Dan. agents uh, from Porton Down. This is not the response of a country that really believes itself to be innocent. This is not the response of a country uh, that really wants to engage in getting to the bottom of the matter. Uh, the Prime Minister told the House of Commons there were two possible um, explanations of this. Either this was a deliberate attack by the Russian state or else the, the Novichok has come out and become um, and got into the hands of criminal gangs. You seem to be excluding the latter well, possibility now. We gave the Russians every opportunity to come up with an alternative uh, hypothesis such as the one that uh, you have just described, and, and they haven't. And their response has been a sort of mixture of, of smug sarcasm and, and denial, mm. obfuscation and, and delay. So, so what we are doing on the on the, the Novichok and on the, the nerve agent. What we will do is tomorrow, uh, technical experts from uh, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons uh, will come uh, from The Hague uh, to the UK. Uh, we will share the samples with them. They will then be tested uh, by the most reputable possible international laboratories. Blah, 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 blah. Boulder dash. Boulder dash. Bollocks. Keep repeating it and people will either A, believe it or B, get sick of hearing it and switch off. We're going to send it to some reputable scientists who are going to analyse it. Yes, it sounds very much like a few good men. We've got a few good men on the arm. We're going to send them the sample and they're going to tell us what they found. Of course, protocol dictates that Russia should be given a sample of this to give their own scientists a chance to analyse it. But the UK government has refused to do that. To hell with protocol, right? Right. Johnson then insisted that because the international community was also convinced that it, that it is Russia, that it was Russia, we should just accept it. To the best of our knowledge, this is, this is a, uh, a Russian-made 
uh, nerve agent that falls mm. within the category Novichok, made only by Russia. And, and just to get back to the point about the international reaction, which is, which is so fascinating, uh, people have all now experienced, whether it's in America, uh, Germany, France, uh, say nothing of the, of the Baltic countries, the Balkans, and, and Pan, they've all experienced Russian meddling, malign, disruptive Russian behavior over the last few years. They can see a country that is going in the wrong direction. And that's why they're so inclined now to not to give Russia the benefit of the doubt and to stand shoulder to shoulder with the UK. Yeah, all manner of accusations have been made against Russia since Russia intervened in Syria and prevented the intelligence agencies of the United States, the UK, France and Israel from turning Syria into the basket case that they turned Libya into. Right? Russia got involved and said, no, now you've surrounded our country. You've surrounded us uh, to the north, to the south, to the east and to the west with NATO bases, reneging on a promise made at the end of the Cold War. Uh, we can't have Syria um, completely turned into the lunatic asylum that Libya now is. So Russia intervened, quite rightly, stood alongside Assad, quite rightly, while the intelligence agencies of this country, uh, France, the United States and Israel, armed and trained the most vile nutcases that we've seen, at least in my lifetime anyway. These Wahhabi jihadi nutters. Russia said we can't have that. So since then, Russia has been accused of everything. Interfering in the EU in-out referendum here in the UK, interfering in elections across Europe and in the United States, and there's no evidence of it. So it's a big playground bully, Russia. We've all experienced their dirty tricks, says Boris Johnson, and Andrew Marr just says, yeah. Moving on. So what about these Russians in London, these wealthy Russians in London, many of whom have donated to the Conservative Party? Stories came out last week about £800,000 from various Russian millionaire stroke billionaires in London. What about them? What about the idea now that they're going to be tackled if they can't account for their, for their, for their fortunes, for their houses, for their cars, and all of that jazz? Well, Andrew Marr had a very, very uncomfortable question for Boris Johnson. Hilarity ensued. I genuinely made a little wee-wee laughing at this this morning. Do you want to hear it? Here we go. About... Well, about a game of tennis. Uh, Labour says that part of the Conservative hesitation on this is that you, as a party, have been taking far too much money, Russian money for far too long. And there's the case um, of the lady Lubov Chanukin, Chanu, 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 who paid £160,000 to have tennis, a game of tennis with you. Yeah. Did well, that I, game actually take place? Can I, can I just make a point about uh, this whole um, anti I, I'm You're going to say good Russians I, and I, bad Russians. I know no, that. No, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I am, actually. I was going to say back to you that, that this, this lady's husband was a minister of Vladimir Putin and was given an award by Vladimir Putin. So he was close to the regime. And you, as a party, were prepared to take £160,000 from her so that she could have a game of tennis with Boris Johnson. Well, Bit if, if, if there is evidence of uh, gross corruption in the way that gentleman you mentioned... That... <laughs> So she paid £160,000 to the Conservative Party to have a game of tennis with Boris Johnson. Husband was a minister in Putin's government. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. Please disperse. Mentioned obtained his uh, wealth or... Then, then, it is, then it is well within the... Uh, it is possible for our law enforcement mm. agencies to deprive him, to deprive him of his wealth with an unexplained... Uh, wealth order. Uh, that is a matter for that is a matter for the authorities. It's not a matter for me, and it is very very important now because I'm getting a lot of pe people are, uh, are emailing, emailing me from uh, from Russia who feel that uh, that they feel that They're Russians. Like, okay, yeah, no, it's very very important that we stress I agree with that, sir, but that I, I, Russians, the Russians themselves, I just, are, are in no way the object of our wrath. I accept it is that. Not I just, the Russian I just people. want to pursue we this have particular no quarrel, case. If we I have may. no quarrel with the Russian people. Did the tennis game actually happen? It did. It did. Um, are you happy that the same lady, and again, do you know enough about the origins of that money? And she has now paid £30,000 to sit next <laughs> to Defence Secretary Gavin Williams. Oh, all oh, right, right, right. She's now paid £30,000 to sit next to the Defence Secretary Gavin Williamson at a dinner. This is the clown Gavin Williamson, the cretin, who screamed at Russia last week during a speech to shut up and go away. 
when this woman, who was married to a former minister in Putin's government, gave 160 grand to play te- <laughs> to play tennis <laughs> with Boris Johnson. Right, we won't labour the point. Um, 160 grand to play tennis with him, and now 30 grand to sit next to Gavin Williamson. Yeah. It's not good, is it? Three Gavin Williamson and have dinner with him. Are you happy about that? Look, uh, unless and until evidence is produced against individual Russians, I do not think that the entire nation uh, should be uh, should be calumnified. You see, Marsh, you jump in. He kind of jumps in, but he doesn't say what he should say. He should say, listen, pal, nobody's talking about demonising an entire nation. We're talking about Putin and the Kremlin. We've done that. Now we're talking about some billionaires in London. We're not talking about the entire nation. Is it okay that you should take 160 grand for a game of tennis from a woman who's married to a former minister in Putin's government? Shouldn't you resign, Boris? Shouldn't you resign in disgrace? Shouldn't this bring the government down, Boris? Effectively. In light of what you're trying to... What you're trying to enforce upon the people of the UK what you're trying to imposition the people of the UK with, namely that we basically should be in some sort of a heightened Cold War with Russia worse than it ever was and then we find out that some of Putin's closest allies have been giving you money to play games of tennis and all the rest of it Brilliant, isn't it? It's a, and, it's a difficult and, balance, I absolutely agree with that. I, I, but it is very, very important. There are many... Mar is digging him out there. You see, that's called digging him out. This is journalism in 2018. It's absolutely rubbish. It's a difficult balance. Mar should be nailing him to the wall, like a good presenter would do. Because that's probably the tip of the iceberg. Dinners and games of tennis and all the rest of it. Russians who have come to this country and made their lives here uh, and contributed magnificently to yeah, our uh, culture Russians, and our society. Russians have uh, come to London and made their lives here and, and, and they're good and they've left Russia. Yeah, but what if some of those Russians very close ties to the so-called regime and are now basically taking ownership taking ownership of people like you and Gavin Williamson and others by giving you enormous amounts of money. What about that? Anyway. Of course, Andrew Marr didn't twist the knife as any decent presenter would do. You see, this is filthy, it's dirty, it's corrupt. Public life is a cesspool. Remember, Andrew Marr never asks a question of any Conservative politician about HSBC Bank giving a loan of £214 million to the company IPGL in 2008. Do you remember that? You remember that in 2008, a man called Michael Spencer, who at that time was the Conservative Party treasurer and chief fundraiser. This is brilliant. This Pull up a chair, this, because you've heard this on this programme, and this is the only programme you've ever heard this story on. So I'm going to tell it here again. Pull up a chair there. Back in 2008, Conservative Party Treasurer and Chief Fundraiser Michael Spencer owned a company called IPGL. IPGL was worthless. It was on its arse. It had liabilities and creditors coming out of its back passage. Finished. No lending institution on planet Earth would have given it a sausage, let alone £214 million. Why? was £214 million given by HSBC to a worthless company owned by the Conservative Party treasurer and chief fundraiser. At the car wash, at the car wash, yeah. See, it's called money laundering. What they did was then started loaning money to the Conservative Party. This is all true. It isn't conjecture. It isn't conspiracy theory. No No news outlet in this country has ever taken this on. Bring down the government? Should have seen people like Michael Spencer and others arrested and interviewed under caution. Cesspool. Filthy. Public life. It's not unique to the Conservative Party either. It's the same right across the spectrum. Right? Tennis lessons. Or a game of tennis with Boris Johnson for 160 grand. 30 grand to sit next to the Defence Secretary 
and this woman is directly linked to the man they want us to believe is killing people on the streets of Salisbury using chemical weapons. The same people are telling you this stuff. 20 minutes to the top of the hour as I do this live. This is Sunday View, March 18th, 2000. And 18. So the Mail on Sunday dealing with that story, their headline is PM's war on Putin's McMafia million, same story. You know, going after the earnings of these people and if they can't explain them, taking the money away. Shall I take a break before we do Hitchens? Very quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about Peter Hitchens' excellent piece in today's Mail on Sunday about McCarthyism. It's very good. Back in two. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www. Markbayevsky.com. It could just change your life forever. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Welcome back, my friend Phil Restino in Florida, who will join the program on, on Tuesday. Phil says, how much for a round of golf? How much for a round of golf indeed? Excellent piece on free speech, free thought by Peter Hitchens in today's Mail on Sunday. I'll read you a little bit of it. He writes, does Hitchens, is this a warning in the past few days? I have begun to sense dangerous and dark new intolerance in the air, which I have never experienced before. An unbidden instinct tells me to be careful what I say or write in case it ends badly for me. How badly? That is the trouble. I am genuinely unsure. I don't know if he did or if he didn't, but did Peter Hitchens have anything to say when the excellent Irish author and journalist Kevin Myers lost his job over a benign comment in an article he wrote for the Sunday Times? I wonder. I'm not condemning Hitchens if he didn't. But there weren't, there weren't many journalists, if any, who came to Kevin Meyer's aid in terms of speaking up for him. Because there is a dark and dangerous intolerance in the air, of course. Not just on the issue of Russia. But anyway, Hitchens continues. I've, all, I've been to many countries where free speech is dangerous. I've always assumed there was no real risk here. Really? Come on, Peter. He writes, now several nasty trends have come together the treatment of Jeremy Corbyn, both by politicians and many in the media, for doing what he is paid to do and leading the opposition seems to me to be downright shocking. I disagree with Corbyn about many things and loathe the way he sucked up to Sinn Féin, but he has a better record on foreign policy than almost anyone in Parliament. Above all, when so many MPs scuttled obediently into the lobbies to vote for the Iraq war, he held his ground against it and was vindicated. Corbyn has earned the right to be listened to and those who now try to smear him are not just doing something morally wrong, they are hurting the country. And then he writes, look at our repeated rushes 
into foolish conflict in Iraq, Libya, Syria and Afghanistan all have done us lasting damage. Everyone I now meet, or everyone I meet now thinks they were against the Iraq war. I know most of them weren't, but never mind. Libya remains an unacknowledged disgrace. David Cameron has not suffered for it, and those who cheered it on have yet to admit they were mistaken. Yet we pay for it literally every day. And now listen carefully to what Hitchens writes, and think back to the beginning of this programme when I read from the RT.com article where the Russian Defence Ministry is claiming that the United States is training militants to deploy chemical weapons in a false flag attack that could be blamed on Assad. Listen to what Hitchens says very carefully and I quote it word for word. He says, he writes, Along with our clinically insane covert intervention on the site of Al-Qaeda in Syria, the Libyan adventure created the unending migration crisis across Europe, which in my view threatens the stability of the whole continent. Clinically insane covert intervention on the side of Al-Qaeda in Syria. Replace Al-Qaeda with ISIS. Replace ISIS and Al-Qaeda with lunatic Wahhabists. Why would they do that? This is what pisses me off about Hitchens and other journalists. They continually try to write this lunacy off as bad foreign policy management. They will not entertain the idea that the result was the always sought result. That these, these criminals who operate within the deep state here and in America, in France, in Germany and in Israel, that they are trying to bring about this madness. See, these journalists won't entertain that. Keep saying, oh, it's just bad foreign policy. Just a dreadful mistake. You know? He goes on to say, in any case, the crude accusation of treachery, with its implication of treachery, frightened me. This is treachery. Corbyn basically being accused of treachery for standing up and asking for evidence, or at least appearing to do that. I expect as time goes by, I will be accused of being an appeaser and of being against British values. And then what? Hitchens writes, an apparatus of thought policing is already in place in this country. And then he writes, by foolishly accepting bans on Muslim extremists, we have licensed public bodies to decide that other views too are indeed extremists. Maybe Hitchens is finally waking up to that, which people like the guests who come on this program have been waking up to for years. Totalitarian stampede, not a tiptoe. And it's frustrating reading his analysis because either he censors, still is censoring himself in terms of where he won't go or he's being edited, you know, or maybe he's nervous about what might happen if he goes that bit further. But it's a very good piece nonetheless and it's in the mail on Sunday if you want to read it all. Baroness Shami Chakrabarty is a Labour peer. Big Corbyn ally, of course. She was a, a campaigner against surveillance and many other issues for years. Liberty she headed up for many years. She was asked about McCarthyism on the Andrew Marr show today. McCarthyism. Here's Andrew Marr and Shami Chakrabarty. Do you think in the last couple of days there has been a McCarthyite atmosphere in this country? I, I don't want to make things worse. I want to make things better. So I'm not going to escalate my language at, at this point, if yeah. you'll forgive me. OK, I, I was... I mean, Jeremy Corbyn suggested there was a sort of McCarthyism about... And certainly he has had a lot of abuse hurled at him over this. He has had... Um, a lot of abuse hurled at him for a very long time and I try to learn from his his dignity under fire. Yeah. Yeah, his dignity. I don't want to say this and I'd rather not say that. Well, spit it out, you virtual signal, virtue signalling muppet. Grow a pair. What a tosser. The, the tossers these people are. You know, tell the truth. It's Stalinist to have the press and to have politicians say that any criticism of the state, any criticism of May or her defence secretary, Williamson, or any criticism of the intelligence services is tantamount to treason. It's unacceptable. Hitchens is right. I don't want to say this and I don't want to say that. 
Dreadful these people. It's a cesspool. Listen to her answer, Shami Chakrabarty, when she's asked about the credibility of the UK intelligence services. Do you trust our intelligence services on this? I do. So there's no need, therefore, to send the Russians uh, evidence of the, the nerve agent used. We, we, can, we can accept their word that it was Novichok. No, no, it, it, here's the thing about um, sending um, agents at, be, beyond this country, either to, either possibly to, to the Russians if they're asking for it, or, or to, to the... organisation for the prevent, The prohibition. reason for doing that is because it's the protocol of the convention. And I believe in pursuing um, uh, these investigations under international law because that's how you garner the broadest international co coalition to, uh, to, to get support going forward. You stupid, ignorant son of a bitch, dumb bastard! Jesus Christ, I've met some dumb bastards in my time, but you outdo them all! Do you trust our intelligence services on this? I do. Yeah, she does. The same intelligence services that told the UK that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction, the same intelligence services that told the UK that Saddam had the capability to launch an attack that would strike the UK in 45 minutes, the same intelligence agencies that lied about Libya, that lied and said that Gaddafi death squads were murdering civilians in Libya when they weren't doing that, the same intelligence services that said that there was a moderate... Um, people led genuine revolution in Libya that needed to be helped when in fact they were lunatic Wahhabi jihadists as I've described earlier on. At what point do you stop believing them, Shami? At what point do you say, no I don't, Andrew? Funnily enough, I, I don't believe them. I can't believe them, Andrew, and I'll tell you why. And then you list out lie after lie after lie after lie. And then you challenge Mar to counter that as the gatekeeper that he is. Well, you counter that. Why would I believe them when they say this nerve agent is a chemical weapon, it could only have been made in Russia, and Vladimir Putin ordered it. Why should I believe it, Andrew? Yeah. Eight and a half minutes to the top of the hour. Sunday Observer, front page, revealed 50 million Facebook files taken in record data breach. Now, this is a big, big story, which we probably will get into in some depth uh, tomorrow or Tuesday when we can get comment on it. The data analytics firm that worked with Donald Trump's election team and the winning Brexit campaign allegedly harvested millions of Facebook profiles of US voters in one of the tech giant's biggest ever data breaches and used them to build a powerful software program to predict and influence choices at the ballot box. Right? Right. See where this is going? A whistleblower has told The Observer how Cambridge Analytica, we've heard about Cambridge Analytica before, and uh, Robert Mercer, and we've heard these allegations before that this company helped to influence people's decision when they went to the referendum ballot boxes back in June 2016. So a whistleblower has said that this company, which was headed at the time by Steve Bannon, of course, Trump's advisor, used personal information taken without authorization in early 2014 to build a system that could profile individual US voters in order to target them with personalised political advertisements. That is what is being claimed. And a man called Christopher Wiley, who worked with a Cambridge University academic to obtain the data, he told The Observer, we exploited Facebook to harvest millions of people's profiles and we built models to exploit what we knew about them and target their inner demons. That was the basis the entire company was built on. Now, dear listener, it's, it's a Sunday. We're not far from midday. I've heard some horse manure in my time as a presenter and as a producer. Been doing it for over 20 years. I've never heard such bullshit in all my life. We exploited Facebook to harvest millions of people's profiles. We built models to exploit what we knew about them and target their inner demons. <laughs> that was the basis the entire company was built on. And the Observer, of course, pro-Remain Observer, pro cultural Marxism pro-immigration observer um, has said that it has seen documents and basically it is confirming the story. That's... I can't really find any more words to describe 
how absolute, how absolutely dreadful that is to be dressed up as journalism and to be dressed up as an exclusive, to be sold to the people of the UK as evidence of collusion between between billionaires running companies like Cambridge Analytica and members of Trump's team and Brexiteers to use your inner demons against you to influence your decision to vote one way or the other. It is a pile of shit. But it's being sold today by the Sunday Observer as proof of collusion here, collusion there, collusion where they want you to believe there's collusion. But in fact, there's no proof. This is a couple of statements from these guys in the story and the Observer's own insistence that it has seen documents. And if we've seen the documents, well, you better believe it. Uh, yeah, this is true. We built models to exploit what we knew about millions of people and to target their inner demons. That, dear listener, is what passes for journalism in 2018. And friends of mine are telling me they're a little bit confused by what's being claimed there. Let me just reiterate before we get out of the programme at the top of the hour. Cambridge Analytica... It has been claimed, harvested millions of Facebook profiles of US voters. So they basically hacked the Facebook profiles of millions and millions of voters to target them with advertising and to target them with political, with political propaganda effectively in order to influence how those people went on to vote. And they're saying the company at the heart of this is Cambridge Analytica, which is owned by a hedge fund billionaire called Robert Mercer. And at the time of the election, his company, Cambridge Analytica, was headed up by Steve Bannon, a key advisor of Trump. They're saying that the personal information of millions of people was taken without their permission their personal information to build a system that could target people and tell people whatever they needed to be told in order to sway their vote, whether it was one way or the other. And that's horse shit. There's no proof of it. And I'm going to get out of the programme now because it's time to go. I was going to talk about Hillary Benn and Brexit, but I can't because I don't have any time. We'll do that tomorrow. They're trying to delay the exit of the UK from the European Union and they're trying to prolong this so-called uh, this so-called said for me transition period it's a big story we'll do more on it uh, tomorrow and Tuesday there you go it is a mad world I want to thank you very much for listening to Sunday View uh, thanks for listening to it thank you for sharing it it will appear on YouTube it will appear on Podomatic Spotify and iTunes very soon my name is Richie Allen by the way and somebody's ringing me, and I, I don't think I turned my phone off, did I not? Probably didn't. Yeah, that's my phone ringing in the background. Um, that's a very rookie mistake, that, not to turn your phone off. I ordinarily do. Saved by the bell, you could say. Um, it was St. Patrick's Day yesterday, um, so we're going to leave the programme with something a little bit Irish. Uh, not entirely Irish, but just a little bit Irish. And uh, wish you all the very best for the rest of your Sunday. Wrap up, it's freezing out there. Snow everywhere, wrap up. Uh, wrap up well wrap up good look after yourselves and one another I'm back with you live tomorrow at 7pm UK time for the live Richie Allen show richieallen.co.uk Fab Radio 2 in Manchester trigger warning and all the rest of it leaving you with Lick the Tins and their cover of Can't Help Falling in Love With You see you tomorrow enjoy your Sunday bye now bye now